afternoon, everyone. Greetings. My name is Minister Michael Muhammad. I am coming to you as a co-founder of the Street Peace Coalition. We are an ad hoc grassroots community organization that is dedicated to violence intervention, violence prevention, and addressing issues of violence, specifically in the black community. Um, and so we, we are happy to be back on air with you again here at CAN TV on Channel 21 on your uh, Comcast station in Chicago where we will be talking about all things related to crime and violence in the black community and in, a, in the United States in general. Uh, this is um, the first show of our new season and so we look forward to talking to you. If you would like to call in and, and raise a question or make a comment about our topic or our subject matter, you can see the number at the bottom of your screen, screen is 312-738-1060. That's 312-738-1060. And we would be happy to take your call. So for our first, um, oh, and let me do a quick uh, shot to our contact information for the Street Peace Coalition. There you see our Facebook page, uh, and you also see a link to our website. And so if you'd like to find out about the Street Peace Coalition, who we are, what our mission is, what uh, have been some of the activity that we've been engaged in, then please uh, check out our website, uh, friend us on our Facebook page, and, um, you know, fill out the contact form on our um, website. We'd love to add you to uh, the email blast that our group is included in that goes out three or four times a month to keep you abreast of what we're doing. If you would like to get involved with helping us in the community, we, as I said, we're an ad hoc group. We're unfunded. We work off of volunteers that understand the need, the urgency to take responsibility for making our communities a clean and safe place to live. And, uh, and so that's what we do. And so, uh, we would love to have you uh, volunteer a few hours every week to join us, to help us make this effort successful, make it grow, and make it effective in the communities in which we serve. Um, and so tonight I want to talk a little bit about um, crime and violence in the city of Chicago. Uh, on tomorrow, I believe it is, or the next day, uh, the mayor of Chicago is going to roll out a new budget, and in that budget, of course, there's going to be a discussion of how that budget affects crime and violence in the city of Chicago. And as we all know, Chicago has a, a reputation, a very notorious reputation, for being a violent city. Some of that reputation is deserved, um, and some of it may not be deserved, but nevertheless, the reputation exists, and it is not existing in a vacuum, because Chicago has a lot of violence, particularly in the black communities of the South and West Sides, and certain neighborhoods on the South and West Sides of Chicago. And so to, uh, when the new budget is released for 2018, it will probably be uh, rubber stamped by our elected officials, our aldermanic officials, elected officials, who tend to vote lockstep with the mayor, regardless to uh, the effectiveness of the a vision, the management scheme, or the fiscal systems put in place to manage 
taxpayer dollars, the budget is usually approved. And so normally, the Chicago Police Department has a budget of somewhere around a billion and a quarter, uh, a billion and two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, two, I'm sorry, two, two hundred million to three hundred million dollars. A billion to two to three hundred million dollars go into the known Chicago police budget. And that is to deal with the fact that in Chicago, this year, so far, we've had over 500 people, a little under 530 or 40 people, I believe, that have been killed by gun violence. We've had um, around 2,400 people that have been shot and wounded. They survived the shooting. Uh, we've had a total of over 3,000 people shot victims of gun violence in Chicago in 2017, and we're on pace, I think we have about 560 or 70 uh, homicides total in the city of Chicago for the year of 2017. And so there is a billion, two to three hundred million dollar budget allocated toward uh, law enforcement, the Chicago Police Department in particular, to redress and respond to this violence. Of course, we are not talking about criminal assault. We're not talking about batteries. We're not talking about, about burglaries and robberies, rape, uh, and the other tracks of crime that take place on a daily basis. And so, um, crime is a big ticket item in Chicago. And so, over the, since the current administration has been in office, uh, homeowners have been the victims of tax increases, uh, as well as the common citizen has been the victim of tax increases on everything from uh, plastic grocery bags uh, to uh, water bottles to uh, increases uh, in water tax for water in the city and just a, uh, a litany of small taxes. Sometimes we know about these taxes, sometimes we don't know about these taxes, but all of these taxes or most of them, in one way or another, are, are, are connected or deliberately connected to this, um, reput this violent reputation that exists in the city as a way of stoking our fears, our stress, our anxiety, and our biases and stereotypes about crime to justify or make us feel as though uh, the taxes that are imposed upon us are justified. And so crime has become a big ticket item is what I'm trying to say. Crime has been used to justify victimizing the populace uh, for faulty uh, civic leadership. Uh, and so when we look at crime, this is a very deep conversation no matter what um, uh, aspect of crime we look at. In the black community, uh, we uh, suffer from, you know, uh, uh, bad behavior. This is, a, this, is a, this is a truth. We suffer from poor conduct. We suffer from dysfunction. We suffer from the behavior that is uh, a byproduct of what we call self-hatred. We suffer also on top of that self-hatred. And because our self-hatred is so deep and so thorough, then 
like the rest of America that has a fetish for guns in the black community, those of us, particularly as black men, young black men, and adult black men of every uh, generation, we also have adopted a gun craze where we use guns uh, to compensate and apparently for many of us to overcompensate for feelings of powerlessness, feelings of insecurity, of feelings of an inability to resolve um, the nature of black life in a way that does not um, gratify or we find trouble finding gratification for our anger and our frustration and our rage in productive, constructive, redirective ways. And so we tend to lash out at ourselves. We tend to inflict harm on ourselves, unlike any other group in society, but this behavior, this uh, pathology, if you will, this psychosis, if you will, is connected to these broader issues of crime and violence uh, in our society. And so um, we need to be able to look soberly at this topic of violence. And so the Street Peace Coalition, we started um, a few years ago with primarily black men coming in a room uh, talking about the shift in the nature of violence in the black community. There's a long history, pardon me, of violence in the black community, but in the last 15 years or so, there's been a subtle shift in the nature, if you will, the quality not the quantity, but the quality of violence in the black community. And so we started having ad hoc meetings with uh, brothers, uh, men who uh, have a concern, men who uh, are formerly or currently associated with uh, street organizations, but have a concern and have a realization that because of that affiliation and because of their ability to um, have influence in that affiliation that they have some responsibility to make an effort to redirect, redress, if you will, this kind of uh, out of control uh, violence that's going on in the black community. Uh, when I say that, we need to understand that there was a time in the black, we've had street organizations in the black community going back, they predate the street organizations that we know of. There was, there was organized crime in the black community. There's been organized crime in the black community pre-street organizations going all the way back to the policy kings. And a little before that, there was always a, a, an organized, there were always organized entities that controlled street life uh, in the black community. Um, and so violence in association with street life is not new but it has intensified as time has marched on into the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, until today. But even in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and for a few days in the 80s, uh, there were rules. There was a clear demarcation between those who consciously decided to be involved with street life and those who were what we would call civilians. 
And there was always a respect of boundaries, for the most part, of those who were actually in the street life and associated or affiliated with some entity in street life and those who were regular folk who were going about their life day to day with no interest, no desire, and no knowledge of street life. And so there was a long tradition of those in the street life knowing that you could not be allowed to harm someone who was not committed to street life or some organization or entity affiliated with street life. And so for the most part, violence was confined to those that were in the world of street life and its associated violent behavior. Uh, and those outside of that world could walk through the community, could sit on their porch, could ride the bus or drive their car or ride their bike or allow their children to go out in the neighborhood and play unencumbered without fear. They didn't have to worry about their children being harmed at a park or standing on a block or even playing basketball or whatever in an alley. Uh, there's a long tradition of the boundaries existing between civilians and those, as I said, uh, that we call, in a general sense, associated with street life. And so over time, that has eroded. It began to erode in a real fashion in the middle part of the 80s, after the mass, the federal indictment of the uh, El Rukin organization, street organization, and religious uh, movement, when the federal government arrested, oh, 40 or so El Rukins uh, and removed them off of the street, destroyed their headquarters on 39th Street. Uh, once that happened, uh, unbeknownst to the public, the very entity that was preventing uh, crack cocaine or what was called Ready Rock from being sold and distributed in Chicago now was not there. And so uh, now this opened the streets of Chicago, the black community in particular, up to set up shop for Ready Rock, or what we know as crack cocaine, to be sold and uh, infect the city of Chicago. And so from the mid-80s forward, this crack cocaine era, this, this uh, poison, this disease of crack cocaine began to spread like wildfire in the black community. And with the spread of this form of narcotic, it shifted. It shifted the boundaries. It began to shift the rules. It began to change the nature of life in Chicago and specifically black life in Chicago. And so those boundaries, those rules, those even the rules even the rules stayed in place, but but the nature of this drug uh, epidemic, as it began to rise, you 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 had more challenges to the rules. You had more assaults on the boundaries between civilians and those in the street life. And so, as time marched forward, you had the breaking down, along with a shift now. Uh, under Ronald Reagan and under Bill Clinton, especially Bill Clinton, you had a shift in federal policy on drug sentencing, the war on drugs, quote unquote. Uh, and you also had an associated shift in federal housing policies and other federal policies that had an impact on black life the nuclear, as we call, traditional nuclear family structure in the black community was being assaulted on all fronts. And so the war on drugs, driven by 
a lot of factors, but we'll just focus on the crack cocaine. Uh, this war on drug, the war needed bodies. It needed, it was, it was focused on young black men. It was focused on black men in general. And, and, and black men became the target, became the demonized object of the war on drugs. And so the effort was to lock up black men in wholesale numbers. These, this is just a fact of history. You may not like me articulating this. It may not be popular or, or easy for some of you to hear this, but this is not my history. I didn't invent this. This is just the facts of history and time. And so the war on drugs now was uh, attacking black men. Uh, other federal policies now were making it unpopular, unfavorable, and intolerable for black men to uh, now um, uh, maintain the traditional family structure. In fact, black women were rewarded more for not having us in the home than they, and they would use, they would lose any uh, social assistance that they received uh, to take care of their children if, in fact, we were in the home with our women and children. And so um, the black family structure was under assault by the federal government from the mid-80s in a very, very, very intense way until today. And so this is why Dr. Michelle Alexander is able to produce another uh, uh, very cogent scholarly examination of the prison, uh, the school to a prison pipeline uh, in, in her book. And so all of this is going on, but in the midst of that, it's intensifying now the kind of violence that's going on in the black community. It's because now the drug culture, the easy access to money because crack cocaine was so powerful, so highly addictive. People could smoke at one time and be addicted for, uh, you know, maybe the rest of their life. Now money was flowing everywhere. And so now street organizations that originally began out of the thought that, look, uh, yeah, we fight a little bit with each other neighborhood to neighborhood, but, you know, at the end of the day, really we started, we came together because of segregation. We came together because this group would ride into our community that were not a part of our community and assault us because of the color of our skin. And so as young men, we wanted to fight back. And so we began to naturally form groups, defense groups that we today, you know, the media calls them gangs. And I guess in some regard, they are gangs, but we use the term street organizations. And so we move from that mindset now fast forward into the 80s where uh, these organizations now have access to so much easy, quick money that now the rules that govern them, the rules, the principles, the values, the laws that set up strict rules about not harming people not associated with street life, uh, all, now those rules were being violated wholesale because men and women now were thirsty for easy money and, and were willing to go all out to get this easy money. And so we have arrived in the aftermath of that. I'm fast forwarding because we're almost out of time. We are living in 2017 in the aftermath of all of that where crime now seems to have no boundaries. It seems to be no rules. It seems to be no one who can govern and control our young people and slow down this violence. And so uh, we're out of time for today's show. Those of you who watched, I want to thank you for tuning in. 
and hopefully we will be able to go a little bit further down this line and each week look at some different aspect of uh, violence in Chicago and in the black community. Thank you for tuning in to the Street Peace Coalition on Chicago Cable, Can TV 21.